All right, hello everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Akkad and Coca Report. I'm Michelle Akkad with you in San Francisco, and my co host Anish Coca joins us from Philadelphia. And Anish, I see in the background here, you know, people on podcast may not see it, but you have a very uh, intriguing uh, new location. Is this your, is, is this your boudoir? Or where, where, <laughs> where are you joining us from? At any from rate. My, uh... <laughs> Yes. Anyway, today, uh, today we're going to discuss uh, the subject of metrics. And with us is uh, Jerry Mueller, who is professor of history at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., where he served as chairman of the department from 2009 to 2015. Professor Mueller's focus is on modern European intellectual history and history of capitalism. And he's the author of many books, notably Adam Smith in His Time and Ours, Conservatism, an anthology of social and political thought from David Hume to the present, Capitalism and the Jews, and most recently, The Tyranny of Metrics, which is his latest volume published earlier this year by Princeton University Press and the subject of our conversation today. Professor Mueller, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be with you. Um, so uh, my first question, what gets a history professor interested in metrics? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, it was a combination of long-term interests, medium-term interests, term interests, and immediate stimuli. The long-term interests are that I've long been interested in the history of public policy and the history of capitalism and how intellectuals in Europe and the United States have thought about capitalism. And one of the recurrent themes has been concerns about the way in which uh, forms of behavior or forms of thought that are characteristic of the market or private enterprise might spill over to other areas of life in ways that could be inimical. So that was sort of the long-term framework. But the medium-term framework was uh, grew out of my interest in public policy. I was paying attention in the early uh, 2000 and aughts to debates about no child left behind in the area of education, uh, which was heavily based upon the idea of measuring performance and rewarding and, and publicizing performance, aka accountability and transparency, and rewarding and punishing performance. So that was in the back of my mind. And then when I was chair, uh, I found there were many aspects of, which is, by the way, the only managerial position I've held in my adult life. Uh, because as you know, the academy is by and large characterized by a great deal of autonomy, which is what attracts people, right. some people like me into it in the first place. But I was in this managerial position and there were many aspects of it in terms of mentoring faculty and making sure that the right courses were taught and hiring the right people that I found quite satisfying. Then I noted at a, at a certain time that there were more and more demands upon the department for data for uh, standardized measures of performance. And I noted that this, that accumulating this data took over, took a good deal of time and that actually nobody made use of it. Uh, so a good deal of it was wasteful, but it got me interested in the whole question of why were we doing this? And it turned out that the stimulus for it was coming not from the university's administration, but from the accrediting agencies, which in turn are uh, legitimated, as it were, by the U.S. Department of Education. And a lot of this went back to a greater emphasis on accountability in college and university education that went back to Margaret Spellings, who was the woman who was also in the Bush, George W. Bush administration, who was behind No Child Left Behind. And then as I followed the threads back, I saw that that in turn was part of a much larger uh, and ever more omnipresent uh, organizational culture that was found in a variety of realms in uh, in K to 12 education, in college education, uh, but also in in medicine, in almost every element of government, and in turn, it was often found in private enterprise corporations. And the more I traced it back, the more I saw that, by and large, it didn't actually originate in private enterprise corporations. It ar it arose in business schools and with business gurus and consultants. And so the point was that, that there was a general sort of organizational mode that was becoming more and more dominant in more and more areas of our lives. And 
the more I researched it, the more I saw that there were recurrent problems. And then it, the, I, I saw that this organizational mode was based upon a number of ideas that seemed eminently plausible at first. But when you looked at how they actually worked out in the real world, one saw that they were often dysfunctional and often dysfunctional in ways that were quite similar from one realm to another. Right. So that's how I got into it. That's, uh, you know, what, what you just mentioned um, about your experience as a, uh, a chair of a department in history is, mm -hmm. you know, immediately um, uh, gives us a, you know, invites a, a comparison with, with medicine, the medical experience, because it's, it's quite similar. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the hospital itself. It's the accrediting agencies and behind the accrediting agencies is going to be the government who's funding mm -hmm. and all that, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But uh, it's interesting that you seem to, to, to be saying, at least in part, that it's not necessarily just primarily uh, uh, bureaucratic demands, um, uh, but it's more global, right? It permeates the, the whole culture. Um, well, I would say it permeates um, bureaucracies in a wide, in a wide uh, range of areas of the culture, including, including the private bureaucracies in businesses, of course. Right. Right, and we'll get to that um, um, uh, in a moment because I, I think I, I find that quite, quite interesting. Um, historically, though, in, in your book, you go back, um, you know, beyond just the last 20 years or 30 years or the, the, the manage, managerial gurus of the 1960s and 70s. Yes. Um, the idea maybe go back, it goes back to uh, the 19th century, perhaps? Yes, when uh, the first place that I could find this idea uh, so the, so let, let me just say a little bit about what the idea is. Uh, okay. uh, and it's based upon several premises which sound um, quite plausible when you first hear them. Uh, the first is uh, a suspicion of, in, of the individual judgment and self-interest of practitioners, that the judgment of practitioners in a wide variety of fields may be either distorted by self-interest or simply by their uh, ineptitude. So first is suspicion of judgment and the notion that the way to combat this is by standardized measures of performance. And then the, the related notion is often that you should publicize these standardized measures of performance. That's sometimes known as transparency or accountability. And the third notion is that you should reward and punish individual practitioners and whole institutions based upon how they perform on these standardized measures of performance. So the first place that I saw this actually implemented was uh, in the 1860s in England when there was a, uh, uh, a liberal member of parliament uh, uh, who was also the Secretary of, of Education, and he wanted to get, uh, he essentially wanted to institute pay for performance uh, in K-12, to what we would call K-12 to education. That is, he wanted inspectors to go in every year. They would measure how each student did on their tests of arithmetic and of English, and if the school was uh, below a certain standard, it would be monetarily penalized. And one of the critics of that was one of my sort of cultural heroes, uh, Matthew Arnold, who in addition to being one of the great English language poets of the 19th century, was a great cultural critic, but his, you couldn't make a living as a poet and a cultural critic. His day job was as an inspector of schools. So he actually had tangible experience of what this government official uh, who was actually his bureaucratic superior, uh, wanted to measure in a standardized way. And he put forward a critique uh, that uh, has remained in many ways timely of how this would, uh, of the various reasons why this was likely to fail and be counterproductive and penalize those schools that had students who were from poor backgrounds, who perhaps wouldn't show up at school or had less educational advantages to begin with and so on. So that first got me thinking about this whole mode of thought. And then a, 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 an important sort of interim stage is that of Taylorism in manufacturing. So the notion that you should measure everybody's tasks and you should create standardized ways of doing the tasks and reward and punish people on the manufacturing shop floor accordingly. And then uh, this, this notion that all of, uh, eventually 
this turned into what I, I'm not the only person to use this term, has call, uh, have called managerialism. Managerialism is different from management. Management this is an important thing to do. Managerialism is a particular kind of ideology uh, often propagated at business schools. One of the first to become a major avatar of it was uh, Robert McNamara, who was a young professor of accounting at Harvard Business School, who then went on to uh, work at uh, Ford Motor and then became the Secretary of Defense, was, was famous for his body counts in Vietnam and so on. Right. And and despite the uh, dysfunctions that that kind of attempt to... Uh, uh, measure everything created during the Vietnam War, it turns out that this, this notion of managerialism, that is the notion that management is not a specific practice or art learned by experience, but rather it's a set of techniques that can be learned fairly easily and then conveyed from one organization to another that eventually spread, uh, as I say, in the private sector, in government, in education, and as you, as you guys very much know, in medicine. Right. Um, and, and then it, it seems, because you give examples that even, it, it spans the political spectrum in a way, because yes. I mean, if we view McNamara as being, you know, on the democratic side, you know, of things, in England, you have the, the Thatcher era, mm -hmm. and the Margaret Thatcher era also, uh, despite the fact that, you know, she allegedly was reading Hayek and so forth, uh, used the same approach uh, to perhaps put order in the unaccountable NHS, you know, and, and run the NHS according to, uh, and, and other, other public programs, uh, according to those norms of, um, uh, which, as you mentioned, you know, measuring, holding accountable, and then punishing or rewarding and that sort of thing. Right. Well, the notion for Thatcher and people like her but often her, but also her counterparts in other countries was, including Democrats in the United States as well as Republicans, was the notion that you had to treat these various realms more like a business. And since there wasn't a bottom line, an easily discernible bottom, bottom line of profitability, you had to create some sort of substitute for bottom lines in terms of these kinds of, uh, of measurements. Right. But so... So by the way, that, that's, that's one of the interesting things that I found, that this, this notion of this combination of measurement, transparency, accountability, reward and punishment has been seen as kind of a silver, silver bullet by politicians and policymakers uh, really on both sides of the political divide and in a wide range of national contexts. Right. And so what's, the, sorry. what's wrong with this, with this approach? I mean, what's wrong? You mentioned uh, uh, Arnold uh, in the 19th century, you know, um, attacking an earlier version of uh, No Child Left Behind. Yes. You know, and pointing out that there are problems, but uh, the, it, it, uh, it came back. That idea came back and, and uh, got amplified and so forth. What's wrong with measuring things and holding people accountable uh, with metrics? Uh, well, there are... There are a range of standard problems. Uh, first of all, I should say, the idea of measuring things is a perfectly good idea. The question is, what's the relationship between the measurement, the, uh, experience, the, the practitioners, and the judgment of the practitioners? So if there's a, there's a huge difference, which is often elided in these discussions, between measurement that is used for diagnostic or analytic purposes by the practitioners themselves to see how they're doing compared to other practitioners or other organizations. There's a huge difference between that diagnostic use of measurement and the kind of measurement that's combined with publicizing the results, that is transparency, and rewarding and punishing. So the normative, uh, it's a normative use of measurement in a way. Uh, well, when it, when, when it conforms to, when the, when it conforms, when the measures conform to the norms of the practitioners themselves, that's perfectly legitimate. It's the attach, it's when they're attached, it's when they're made uh, visible to non-practitioners, and then when the practitioners are rewarded or punished, either 
monetarily or in terms of reputation, uh, that's when you, be get to, when you begin to get a set of standardized dysfunctions, which I would be happy to describe for you. Uh, uh, yes, but you know, we, we're, we're quite familiar as physicians. We, we know that uh, if physicians are rewarded to do certain things, mm -hmm. they end up doing too much of those. If they get punished for doing certain, certain things, they will avoid uh, taking on, say, let's say, high-risk patients to the detriment of the patients. Anish himself uh, published a, a case that, I mean, that he wrote an article that really had a, a lot of visibility because it was a real life case and it was, it was tragic. It was a patient of his, maybe Anish, you want to describe it briefly. Uh, we've talked about it on the show, but. Um, yeah. No, so, spoke, and and, you've, and you've, talk, you've talked about this in your excellent book uh, uh, about uh, public reporting and how public reporting can have deleterious impact by, and uh, specifically, the deleterious impacts relate to um, avoidance by uh, operators of high risk cases, and mm -hmm. so I had a, I had a, you know, I had a somewhat of a tragic, I had a tragic, not somewhat. It was a tragic case of a, a patient who was very ill who needed a, uh, you know, a complex surgery, and I couldn't find a surgeon to operate on him, and uh, I was told point blank by uh, some of the, some of the surgeons who in past years had taken on these type of patients, I was told point blank that, you know, this was really, this was because of public reporting and they were not willing to give the institution a black eye by, you know, playing these type of odds too often. Because you play these types of odds too often, you get, you get public reporting that comes out uh, that's not good. And then the next thing you know, the local paper is running a, a uh, piece on how, uh, you know, your this particular hospital is uh, is slipping in the rankings, and uh, you know yes. that's a very competitive environment. And uh, uh, there are other hospital systems are happy to pile in and pile on and say, "Yep, you know we we do this procedure, and that's why we perhaps are better uh, mm -hmm. than this other group." You know, no no one, you know, there's there's not there, there's, there's lots of knives being pulled uh, in, in 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 the health space because of the, of the dollars that are at stake. So. Yes, so. and and that whole idea, you know, that 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 form of gaming the metrics through it's sometimes called uh, uh, case selection bias in medicine, or sometimes called creaming. That is, you only take the more suitable people. That happens in all sorts of realms. So, universities that want to improve their graduation rates, for example, the there's two ways of do it. There's two easy ways of doing that. One is only admit more qualified students, right? So you, you cream off the best. Uh, and there might be some good reasons for that, but it, it, that's one way of increasing your performance metric of graduation. The other way of gaming that metric that's, quite co that's very common, I'm afraid, is to lower your standards for graduation. So you have various courses where, you know, the instructors are told, uh, 70 or 80 percent of the students have to pass uh, and so they do and the students get a degree and the metric looks good in terms of the number of students who've graduated but it's in this case in that case it's because you've lowered the standards and in other cases as you say as uh, you've indicated there's this whole phenomenon phenomenon of creaming of course in medicine the stakes are very high like in, as in that case they're often of of life and death. Yeah, the, the particularly interesting thing I I found uh, that was um, uh, that 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 that, that kind of hit home uh, was the idea that the reason I mean it was the idea w behind why this is happening. This is happening really to try to disrupt a status quo. Um, mm -hmm. So you know these numbers, this accountability, this transparency, all of it is being used to to kind of um, uh, to kind of give give a give a hard type of base to saying, hey, this is why we need to change what's going on. So whether it be public reporting or whether it be accountability uh, when it comes to um, you know education uh, or what it, whether it comes to you know your nice anecdote uh, about Bob McNamara and uh, how he took over. Uh, the military and or, or and instituted this managerial style. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of it is is geared towards kind of overturning what already exists, and that's why it's bought in. It's it has no. It's not that one party particularly enjoys metrics. It's you know, both parties will use metrics as they see fit to try to to try to shape things towards whatever it is they want. So the Thatcher you know, the conservative government, whether it be Thatcher, whether it be George Bush, or whether it be 
whoever um, will use uh, metrics to try to weaken, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, and I think if people understand that there's a naked ambition here to, uh, that, that is very political, that is very ideological, then perhaps this kind of, uh, uh, this, this, this aseptic-ness that metrics have, you know, metrics, when you, when you start saying metrics, when you, you know, I, we've talked to people on the show earlier about uh, gender pay gaps and uh, it's like, oh, the evidence says this and the evidence says that and, you know, this is the evidence and, you know, you try to come back and saying, well, the evidence is, you know, the evidence that can say many things. <laughs> yes. You're, you're using the evidence in a very particular way to suggest one thing versus the other. Yes. I think, you know, people need to understand that there's grand ideology that sits behind uh, anyone that is sitting on a metric and saying, this is absolute truth. This is Moses himself has carved this on these tablets and this is why we must change things. Yeah. So, 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 there, so often, uh, as you quite rightly say, the metrics are um, based upon an unarticulated but strongly felt ideology. So in No Child Left Behind, for example, one of the main goals, one of the main motivations was to eliminate the so-called achievement gap. That is to say that there's a gap in educational achievement between uh, whites and African Americans and Hispanics and Asians. Nobody complains about the fact that Asians do disproportionately well. Uh, uh, but the assumption is that that, that there must be a problem that lies in the educational system itself. Otherwise, the groups that are performing less well uh, would be performing equally well. And that assumption is itself a, a highly dubious and ideological one. And in fact, uh, no child left, in terms of the actual results, uh, the effect of a decade of no child left behind was absolutely no change in the achievement gap. Uh, and, but, that's, but, 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 that's that's, because... but, that, but that's true, I've got to say, in, in many areas. You know, the reports that I read from Rand and from uh, this uh, scholarly, uh, this academic study in, in, based in Holland about the effect of, um, of, uh, public, uh, perf of, of uh, public performance ratings in medicine indicated that actually it didn't affect consumer behavior, that is patient behavior, and it had no positive effect really on patient outcomes. So one of the things, so, you know, almost getting back to your main point, many of our institutions in our society work less well than we would like. But just because there's a problem doesn't mean that this combination of metrics and pay for performance and, a, and transparency is the answer. Right. But Dr. Mueller, we have, yes. uh, I, I'm ready for you. You, you know, the, the, <laughs> the problem here, the problem here is that we just don't have a good enough metric. Right. We can, mm -hmm. we can, if we just had a better metric, we would, this all, this whole problem would be solved. Right. So that, you know, I've gotten two kinds of responses to the book. One is that from people who professionally work in metrics. Some of them say all we need is better metrics. And others who work in metrics say, yeah, you've articulated what the recurrent problems actually are that we see in our experience every day. And it's true that there are better metrics and worse metrics, but I think what's more important is the way in which metrics are developed and how they're used and who they're used by. Because the, this combination that I've been talking about, about uh, st measuring standardized performance and then making it transparent and paying people uh, accordingly, that leads uh, to the kind of issues of, um, of creaming that we talked about earlier or lowering standards that we talked about earlier. It also leads to goal diversion. That is, people focus on the thing, people, practitioners focus on the things that get measured at the expense of other essential things that don't get measured. Uh, and then it has larger implications too that I think are important in many realms, probably not least in medicine, in terms of motivation. I mean, uh, you know, there, there's extrinsic motivation, there's monetary motivation and so on. And then there are various forms of intrinsic motivation for doing various jobs because the job interests us or because we believe in what the job is there for. So in education, maybe we actually believe in trying to cultivate students' minds or in medicine, maybe we actually believe in healing people. Uh, and when you put everything in terms of uh, measurement by outsiders and then pay for performance, 
you, you, you're essentially trying to replace intrinsic motivation with extrinsic motivation. And if you're successful in that, <laughs> you're actually going to create uh, less motivated practitioners in whatever realm you're talking about. So it has these, uh, you know, there, there, there are immediate problems that it causes, and then, then there are these uh, larger changes in mentality that it tries to bring about. Now, again, some of these things are reconcilable. So we know from, from medicine especially, but also from other areas, if, if the institution or the insurer is rewarding something monetarily that the physicians and nurses and administrators themselves think is an important goal, like safety and so on, then sometimes the extrinsic motivation and the intrinsic motivation can go together. But of course, often enough, they're in tension with one another. Right, they are. And then, you, you know, it, it, it strikes me that, you know, we're talking, I mean, there's this argument of accountability, using metrics for accountability. But it seems to me that it's the reason it's, it's persisting so much and it's so pervasive is because it's precisely a way to deflect accountability away from the managers and the, and the bureaucrats because they, I mean, how often have you seen a guy lose his job because the metrics that, or, or an organization lose its, its job or its funding because the metric that it had used turned out, you know, not to be relevant or to cause uh, you know, <laughs> unintended consequences and so forth. Right. So the metrics Never. are always yeah. a way. I mean, if you're going to have, you know, the, the government saying, well, we're going to fund uh, healthcare and we're going to assure that it's high quality. Well, they have no way of assuring that it's good quality. And, they have, and when they're funding, they're funding money that you know, doesn't belong to, to the government. So it's a mess. And they have to hold people, you know, they, they can't hold themselves accountable. So they say, well, we need metrics. We need metrics and so forth. And the metrics pushes the responsibility and the accountability away from, you know, the origin of the problem, which is always a third party, whether it's in education or in business. There's a third party that doesn't know that is not m held accountable by what is normally, you know, a binary relationship between a student and a school or a patient and a doctor or a hospital and so forth, you know, a, a simple binary relationship when the, the two can hold each other accountable. You have a third yes. party and the third party is, you know, sort of uh, uh, messing things up. Go ahead. Yes, but Michel, that, that would be, there's, there's a lot of truth to what you say, but it's not the whole truth. And this is where I, I differ from people of a, uh, you know, purely sort of libertarian orientation. The problems that I'm talking about exist as much in the private sector, that is to say, within corporations, as they do within the public sector. I have a theory about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but, but part, right, part, part, part of it is because uh, of the attempt in the private sector to eliminate intermediate level, intermediation of information between practitioners and top managers. So when you try to create a, a, a flat management structure or whatever, basically the idea is you, you get rid of the department heads and deans and their, their equivalents in private organizations, and you just have the frontline practitioners and the C-suite. Right? right, and so how's the C-suite gonna? If you've done away with the intermediate managers, the people who actually have contact with the practitioners and know what they're doing, if you do away with them because you're trying to save money, how are the people in the C-suite or the president's office or whatever going to know what's going on? Because they don't have any expertise in the area, they're looking for numbers. So that's so the problems, similar problems or analogous problems, exist in the private sector as well. I agree, but if if um, and the problem is when when we say we cannot disentangle private sector from public sector. I mean they they're so enmeshed uh, together. You know, I mean if if a private company really you know if it made the wrong decision, it would fail. I mean right, it'd be subject to the accountability of the market, and it would fail. And it you know and it doesn't and it's complicated. I. Um, uh, I, I hear you, but it's, it's nevertheless, but even when you have middle managers in very, very large corporations, 
you know, they use the metrics also to sort of, uh, I mean, it's a way of, of deflecting accountability where it's, you know, it's not me, look, we, we've collected the data. So the data, and, and that's where philosophically it's very pervasive, pervasive in the entire culture, is this empiricism that we all seem to be in love with, that the data somehow speaks, you know, the whole truth. And, and you talk about that and you talk about the shortcomings of, of, uh, of this yes, approach. It's, right? it's, what, it's what Hayek and others have called scientism, which is not actually the application of scientific methods from the natural sciences to other areas, but, but, the, but the attempt to treat other areas of life, especially human areas of life, as if they were like physics, say. Right. Uh, where, where, the, the, where the laws are eternal and recurrent and context and uh, the particular situation or the particular organism when you're looking at a human body, um, you know, doesn't matter that much. Uh, and it's that scientism that's the problem. And it can be a way of, uh, I mean, this is why it's so attractive. It looks objective and scientific and economistic. All those are, are uh, uh, culturally attractive uh, sort of penumbras. But in fact, uh, as, as you indicate, what a middle manager who's a good manager can do is look at the metrics and say, okay, here are the metrics. How important are those metrics compared to the things that we haven't measured? Right. Uh, what could explain those metrics, like comorbidities? But then there are some, uh, here I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, speaking in your area that I know relatively little about, but there are some areas of comorbidities, like the whole idea of uh, fragile patients, um, where you can't specify That's right. all the attenuating That's factors or all the risk factors. And that's where the judgment of the frontline practitioner comes in. And then if the person right above her is also a person who has some frontline experience, even though they're not now, now in a managerial role, they can bring that experience to bear. The problem is when the metrics are being sent to people who don't have um, the, who don't have the actual experience and as a substitute for actual experience. Right. Absolutely right. It, it's, it's, go ahead. Yes. Okay. But the, but the, you know, the, 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 so what, you know, the, the problem is there's this kind of mass confusion that's been created because of this focus on process and metrics and you know, scientism. You have folks that are ex, you have folks that are, that are, you know, so Tom Nichols wrote a book, uh, fairly popular, called The Death of Expertise, right? Yes. The Death of Experts or Death of Expertise? Yes. And he bemoaned the idea that, you know, that we we're entering this popular age where, you know, any Yahoo can be an expert on X, Y, and Z, and the true experts, you know, are, like, are, are kind of thrown by the wayside. But the, uh -huh. the question is, the question that, that's raised with, with these hundreds of analysts that are experts in, metrics like Nate Silver in 538. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, he's an, he's an expert. I mean, everyone is an expert. Uh, every, uh, all these process people are, 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 are experts. Uh, these, and, and if you say anything against some methodologist, suddenly you are part of the fake news crew that Lada, Luddites or the, uh, yeah. right. The, yeah. So yeah. the backwards, yeah, so there, right. So, so, so Anisha, I think you've put there's, your finger on it. There's yeah. a difference between being an expert in statistical methods and being an expert in that practice, which the statistics are supposed to be measuring. So there's a difference between yeah. being a, you know, a cardiologist yeah. and, and somebody who's expert in numbers and can play around with those numbers. Yeah, no, and I think, and I think the the public, I think the vast public, I, I don't think there's general consensus even among doctors, honestly, among, uh, as to who is the real expert there. Yeah. So, you know, who who can really speak speak to causal inference? Is it the doctor who's watching something happen, or is it the is it the method the brilliant statistical methodologist? You know, lots of friends of mine, uh, etc. I, I, <laughs> and there's mass consternation about who it is. Who, who would you, who would you say is the expert, and 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 why would you why would you say that? Yeah, yeah. So you know, ideally, one would like the 
practitioners to know just enough about the methods to be able to deal with them critically. And one would like the methodologists to actually have a background in the practice of what they were actually measuring. Uh, and of course, there are, uh, there are uh, academic physicians who, who do that. You've, I think you've had some of them on your show. On your show. Uh, but yeah, there is often, uh, the, look, part of the tension is between the general and the particular. So when you look at like evidence-based medicine, it can give you, it, it can, it seems to me to be one of those things that can be genuinely useful in providing uh, uh, guidance to the practitioner. But then the practitioner has to be able to think through to what degree do these general truths apply in this particular case. And then the question is how much uh, leeway, uh, how much autonomy does the practitioner have to depart from that standardized measurement? That's the right. way I see it anyway. Right. No, I, I think you're right, but I, it's, uh, uh, again, so, so long as there are third parties involved, because the, the, the particular, uh, you know, who's gonna judge whether in the particular the practitioner is doing, you know, correctly or incorrectly? So the practitioner is then judged according to sort of aggregate, aggregate standards, right? Lumping all these people together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's very treacherous. It's, it's, a, it's a big departure um, for but any, Michelle, all kinds of incentives. Yes. Part of, the, part of the issue is here, you know, we'd like to say that the end user is the one who ultimately will say whether the experience is good or not, correct? Right. I mean, I... I, but, I well... Uh, Yes and no. Uh, it's more intangible than that. I mean, if you're going to say the patient, the patient's satisfaction. Uh, well, or, yeah. Well, meaning the, the, here's, the, the, here's the issue, which is where, I mean, there, I think there is a, as, as Dr. Mueller has outlined in his book, there, there is a, 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 a real area of, a real concern in terms of where metrics, the, 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 the desire for metrics arise. It's that, Take physicians, something that we know well, right? There's a wide disparity uh, in terms of physicians, in terms of ability, competence, et cetera, correct? So you, you can walk into, you can take your child who's sick to a physician and they will, and you will come out with some diagnosis that requires some type of therapy that is, that is not benign. You can walk then in two minutes later into another practitioner's office and that practitioner will say, this is a benign condition that does not need any therapy. Um, I don't, yes. So, so that, that's why it's, it's hard in that case for the end user, as you rightly say, to, to actually make an informed judgment. Right, because, because if, even if, if, that, if that end user never got that second opinion and got something, some, say, polyp on some vocal thing taken off, and you know, as long as the patient didn't have a bad outcome, the patient will be really happy. Like, oh my God, this is the most amazing doctor in the world. He... You know, yeah, but it, right, but but I mean, it, it, everyone pats himself on the back. No, but if 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 uh, you know the, the bad apples, you know, among doctors, I mean, if left to the market's own devices, they would they would have a bad reputation. I mean, if if I mean, they would have they if they're going to do bad things, it's going to be apparent. It's going to be apparent, and they they will suffer. They should suffer. But, if if their mistakes are benign and the patients like them because they have good bedside manners or they're good looking yeah. or whatever it is, you know, yeah. other superficial stuff that, you That's know, how I get by. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? yeah. <laughs> but, but if, you know, um, eventually uh, the standard actually, one thing I wanted to say here is that the standard is not really patient satisfaction per se. The standard for, at least when it comes to medical care, the standard is health, right? It's both the doctor. And, I, and my, my understanding is that there's usually, that there's often a big gap between patient satisfaction and patient outcomes. Correct. Correct. Yeah. But, but even outcomes are not necessarily a good, uh, outcomes are a metric, right? Outcomes are not a good reflection necessarily of, of health because health, you can only gauge health individually and it's not something that you can measure. So health is uh, unmeasurable. It's something that you have to have a judgment on. And, and yet it's the same. It's the most fundamental thing. It's, it's what medicine is aimed for, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. the whole of the medical enterprise supposedly is, aimed at improving the health of individual patients. And health itself is, is not measurable because it's not, you cannot put a number to it because 
you know, outcomes sometimes are, you know, I mean, it may be the, the best thing, you know, for somebody, something to happen is for the patient to die. I mean, it may be a good outcome that, that we let them go and that sort of thing. So, um, so it cannot be articulated and therefore, you know, it falls in the category of things that is known sort of tacitly through experience, you know, by practitioners. Mm -hmm. And, but yet we live in an era and, and, you know, that goes back a hundred years, 150 years and whatnot, where we think that, you know, scientifically we can, you know, all of science will compensate for the bad apples, right? It's primarily the, the, uh, the initial uh, argument is that, uh, uh, metrics and so forth will take take care of the bad apples, but in in the process, it distorts the judgment of the good well, doctors. But, start but is that, on, on, on something uh, else. Uh, sorry, Anish, I just want to say first one of the <laughs> one of the problems that I've noted from reading a lot about metrics in various realms is that actually often metrics are pretty good at distinguishing uh, people on the low end that is uh, really deeply subpar performers uh, in teaching and, and in, in medicine, in surgery too. Uh, the problem is, I mean, sometimes, of course, there are extenuating circumstances. And when we say bad apples, we don't necessarily, of course, mean people who are badly intentioned or self-interested. We could just mean people who are incompetent or beyond the age when they're competent or whatever. So, but one of the problems is, the fact that because that although metrics actually sometimes are useful in distinguishing low-lying outliers, they're then extended to everybody all the time with these uh, negative diversionary effects in terms of incentives right. and in terms of time. That's true. But, but let me say something here. When you say that the metrics are good at picking out the, the, the bad apples of the outliers, that, that implies that you have a way an independent way of knowing who the, who the outliers are, right? Since you're comparing the metrics to your judgment and you're using your judgment essentially as a standard, which is fine. And I'm all for it because it, it, it ought to be, you know, you've been an experienced teacher. You've taught for many years. You know who, who the bad teachers are. And you actually really, at the end of the day, you don't really need the metrics. But the um, problem is we're too nice. That the metrics may, may conform uh, to your judgment in a way that may be useful for the bureaucrats, you know, where you can say, well, on that question, my judgment and the metrics, you know, are, are you know, aligned. And, and as you said, you're but, right. some, but sometimes the metrics <laughs> do help me uh, when I was a department chair to get a sense of people who were really low liars or people who were really uh, on, on, the, uh, on the upper edge of performance. And then, then, of course, I had to query them to see why that was the case and whether there were extenuating circumstances and so on. It seems to me that the problem is greater in your fields because the stakes are higher. And uh, from what I've read, there's a propensity of surgeons and so on to have a guild-like mentality and not want to point their finger at people who they themselves think are subpar. No. Please correct me and tell me I'm no, wrong. I, I, I was just going to say that. And I, I was, of course, going point to point the finger at the history professors and say that you guys don't seem to be very good. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, that, no, that's absolutely correct. But in uh, general, but yeah, you're right. In general, it, it, the, part of the, the, the problem is created by us because we are very bad at, uh, po at, at pointing out folks that you know, are perhaps not up to par. And I, but I think that that's a problem that's not unique to us. I think academia is very similar. I mean, there's, I mean, in academia, there's routinely horrendous folks who commit fraud for decades who are somehow still tenured and still finding jobs, et cetera. Me and Michelle were just talking about this right before the show started. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I think, so the problem comes that uh, I guess all of us have a guild-like mentality and kind of want to yeah, but, but uh, let me tell you how, how, how strong of a liberta libertarian I am, uh, Jerry. <laughs> because mm -hmm. The problem, is, it's, it's true, but it's only because uh, of licensing laws. And license, licensing laws for doctors were passed in the 1910s precisely on, an, on a scientific argument. It was a scientific rationale that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but there, there was a famous report, the Flexner Report. It was sure. a... Okay, on medical so, education. Yeah. Right, on medical education. And that was a really, if, if you read it, it was the idea that, you know, the, in essence, 
what we're living now is just an extension of what Flexner was proposing or, or saying medicine is, meaning that it's, it's a, an objective thing and you can measure. And that's the reason why you can have, you know, licensing, you know, we need to license the doctors because they're going to prove explicitly what their fund of knowledge is. And that means that they're going to be good doctors because essentially medicine is a scientific application, which it is not. So, so, Without that, what you had is that the, the, the bad apples were actually, and that's historically quite true. And it's and it's said by mainstream historians who are not crazed libertarians like <laughs> crazed libertarians like me, but mainstream historians of medicine uh, testify that the trend before licensing was that the bad apples were going out of business, and the good medical institutions were flourishing uh, because they were on the basis of reputation and competition. Mm-hmm. And they were not, there was no guild mentality at that point because it was very highly, highly competitive in the U.S., you know, among doctors. And uh, if anything, they were a little too quick, perhaps, at uh, uh, fighting one another. So I think there's a difference between, uh, I mean, I, I think that there are some areas in which there is too much licensure, like hair cutting, but I think it's different for cardiology sorry <laughs> uh, and there I think but I think you have to distinguish between uh, those kinds of certifications that are useful for indicating minimum standards versus metrics that are meant to indicate excellence and that sort of thing. right but you know and, and, and it also could be to get back to your example about uh, practitioners at the beginning of the century it could be that in a more mobile society like we have now where people don't necessarily have access to the same fund of information based on living in a place in a long time and so on. That, uh, and you combine that with the fact that almost all of the areas in which we work are in one way or another bureaucratized, whether it's in government or in medicine or in, or in, private, um, in private industry. Uh, you're going to need you're going to need some kind of metrics. So the question for me is not metrics versus no metrics. It's metrics in which the practitioners play a role in developing and judging those on the basis of their experience versus metrics that are imposed from outside and uh, used by people who don't really have enough concrete knowledge to be able to judge the validity of those metrics. Right. I, I agree with that. Really, my, my beef with the licensure is that it's primarily it's because it's a, uh, it's a state licensure. Mm-hmm. You know, without it, you'd have the metric of the school. You know, what school you, I mean, that, that's a great sort of uh, uh, validator for, for the outsider, for the patient. You know, I mean, it, it, it should be. Nowadays, patients don't really care so much what school you, you went to, but if if there wasn't li- any licensure, it'd be very important. The school would be very important that you trained. The reputation, there'd be other mechanisms by which doctors would be judged for the benefit of, of patients. There would be other things that would sort of or- organically uh, come up and would uh, focus on the right metrics, you know, where appropriate. Because you're right. I mean, metrics are, are very important in many ways. And, and, uh, and I'm bashing them now because they seem to be coming top down from unaccountable bureaucracies that are that tend to be government bureaucracies and that never pay the price for the, the negative consequences of the metrics that they impose on the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, it's important to keep in mind, the government, the, the government policymakers and bureaucrats, they are well-intentioned as well. You know, they want to, they want to get the best bang for the buck in terms of medical costs. And as you know, medical costs are an ever greater, an ever larger percentage of GNP for, for of GDP for all sorts of reasons. Uh, so those people are well intentioned too, and sometimes what they do has benefits. But I think people are insufficiently cognizant of the unintended but now anticipatable negative consequences of some of these pay for performance metrics. It, it's relatively clear, definitely in medicine, that it seems that they're utterly incompetent in uh, sorting out uh, sorting out value. I mean, over and over again now, we've seen pay for, perform- mm-hmm. pay for performance has failed. I mean, they, they, they're, they're trying to manage these incredibly complex systems with these simple metrics. You pointed out very well, you know, what, you know, the, the, the metrics are what you can measure, what you measure, what you can measure is frequently very simple. And you're talking about super complex system. You're talking about the, the, the body. You're talking about outcomes that can be very, 
difficult to pin down. You know, one some outcomes, as Michelle is talking about, can be that the patient should be allowed to be let go. So you have, I mean, for for I think, and boy, you know, that's hard to explain. Yes, exactly. So, and yes. you know, uh, so we have a, I mean, there is zero question in my mind that we can, we have, we're having a nice academic uh, debate about, you know, what, uh, you know, the problems that we have and, and why metrics kind of came about to solve from, but it, it is abundantly clear to me that uh, metrics in medicine for sure have been a step backwards and certainly reducing the, uh, uh, burden of metrics uh, uh, will have immeasurable gains uh, in the short term if if we can if we can find people bold enough to uh, go there. So, mm -hmm. Professor Mueller, I want to say that um, so your book does a fantastic job at um, classifying the different kinds of metrics uh, in 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 their different types, and then you know you have the illustrations in different industries, you know, healthcare, education, police, defense, and you know. Uh, Excellent diagnosis. And at the end, and I think you, you give very common sense um, uh, recommendations about how metrics should be considered and uh, as opposed to just applying them willy-nilly, um, that, that there's a method to understanding uh, the application of metrics and their role in providing, you know, the necessary feedback and, and, and necessary knowledge for all of us to make, uh, make good decisions. And so I, uh, it's a great book. It's a, it's, a, it's academic, but it's not. Uh, it's got lots of references, but it's an easy read. The tyranny of metrics. Any final words uh, uh, of wisdom, or where do you see? I mean, you you have the perspective of a historian, so tell us a little bit how you see things evolving. Um, <laughs> As a big, because, you know, I mean, if it started 50, 150 years ago and some people noticed the problems back then, but it seems to have, uh, you know, gotten worse and worse, where, where do you think things going? So first of all, I should say I'm a historian, not a prophet. It's hard enough to predict <laughs> the past and remind the future. <laughs> uh, to be quite honest, you know, there's this saying by the Italian Marxist uh, philosopher Antonio Gramsci. Uh, uh, pe pe pessimism of the mind, optimism of the will. Uh, when I when I try to think about things, uh, not in terms of what I hope, but where I see the trends going, I'm afraid I see more and more of this dysfunctional metricization in more and more areas. That, it, but I hope that books like mine, and in some ways you know, programs like yours will make more people aware of the downsides of this. And especially if we can get people at the executive level, you know, people on boards, of, on presidents, boards of trustees, boards of trustees of hospitals, uh, people and so on, aware of these characteristic problems. Uh, maybe we can have more of the useful metrics and less of the dysfunctional ones. On that note, uh, you know, thank you very much. I will encourage people. I will have, we will have the link to the book uh, on, on the show notes. Are you on social media? Do you have a blog or, or you just write books? And, and that's, that's uh, plenty for you. I, well, I, 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 plenty, but much more productive than the rest of yeah, us who spend yeah. our time gabbing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I do have a Twitter handle at Jerry Z. Mueller. Uh, and I do try to write books and I do. I have quite a few articles now, uh, um, op-ed style pieces online related to the themes of the book, uh, including one in The Guardian a few months ago uh, that looks at the case of this uh, veterans hospital in Oregon as an example of metrics in medicine gone awry. So people might be interested in that. Oh, those. very good. We'll, we'll certainly link, link to that as well. Uh, Professor Mueller, thank you so much. It was a delightful conversation and I'm sure our audience uh, will have enjoyed it. But uh, before we finish, I want to say, despite all the bashing of metrics <laughs> that uh, you know, we, we've uh, uh, embarked on, we have our iTunes ratings for the Akkad and Coca report is five star out of five. And it's not manipulated. It's uh -huh. absolutely reflective of the quality of the, of the show. And I, uh -huh. I would encourage the audience to uh, you know, keep going and, and plug us and, and rate us on iTunes and uh, spread the word that way. I All will right. do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>
ביי.